you. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with Sheila, who is one of my favorite writers. And um, I just wanted to um, ask you a few questions about Love Child. I was so uh, impressed by the, I, I, I had read it when, uh, some time ago when I gave it a blurb and then just today I sat down and read it again and I thought I would just skim it but I ended up reading every last word and loving it. Um, it what, what, years ago, Sheila, believe it or not, <laughs> was one of my students and uh, at Columbia, and uh, I had I had them all read a story by Chekhov, which is not a very well known story, uh, called A Woman's Kingdom, and um, and 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 you mentioned somewhere that uh, that that this inspired you in writing this book, and I was trying to think about that in the Chekhov story. The woman uh, is from a peasant family that has grown rich in manufacturing. Her father's died, she's the heiress, but she's uh, comfortable neither with the local gentry who scorn her, though they uh, uh, court her benefit, or her handouts, and uh, nor with her workers who are overawed by her wealth. In Love Child, the woman, Bill, she's called Bill because when she was a a youngster, she was quite a tomboy, so her, everybody called her Bill. The woman, Bill, has inherited money from her husband, not her father. She's snubbed by her snobbish sons who are studying at an elite boarding school. They are embarrassed by their mother's jewels and rich clothes. They think she's overdressed. And they're embarrassed by her lack of intellectual culture and her feisty way, uh, and her lusty way of singing in chapel. <laughs> An actor, the nephew of Bill's sister, urges her to take on many, many lovers, just as in A Woman's Kingdom, a Europeanized fop who's sort of maddening, uh, urges the heroine to do the same. And in both works, there's an upstairs-downstairs split, though in Love Child, the separation is exacerbated by apartheid. Maybe you talk a little bit more about how that original story inspired you. Yes. Well, it's funny that it says this because when I when I sent him the book, um, he was so generous about it and said that he liked it so much. Uh, but he did say because I had told him he had taught us this story at Columbia, and it made a lasting impression on me. I mean, there are few things that. Uh, when you're learning that actually stay with you in this way. And one was about this uh, story, that this woman receives a sum of money um, at Christmas time. And the big question behind this, the story that leads you into the story and makes you curious to keep turning the pages is, who's she going to give the money to? Um, and so that was really the connection with the story for me. But when I sent the book to Ed, and he was very generous about it, he said, but I have to tell you, Sheila, I really don't see any trace of that story in this book. <laughs> uh, and of course, it brings up such a, an interesting point, because um, we write, uh, and I'm sure, I know there are lots of writers in the room here tonight, we, our, our ideas come from uh, probably two or three different sources and one of course is life and we're writing from life but the other is literature uh, and I just read Ed's wonderful essay in the New York uh, Review of Books about Paul Bowles um, and the sheltering sky and there he talks about the role of the sheltering sky in the writing of his book The Married Man um, and I couldn't help thinking how um, all our work uh, yes, we're writing about our lives, and he was writing about his life and his lover who had AIDS, Hubert, am I right? And who yes. died in Morocco. Right. And so that it was real, based, based on a true story, as this book is too. But at the same time, it also reflects uh, all those many, and it's not just in a woman's kingdom. I mean, if you think of the, the Will story, because basically that's what it was. Uh, when my mother died, <coughs> she was a very wealthy woman, having inherited money from my father. Uh, but she did not leave her money 
uh, to her one and only daughter, that is me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a question that, when I, it wasn't really something that struck me. I just thought, well, that's the way it is. That's what's happened. But when I told people the story, I got this kind of jaw-dropping response. You know, and the eyes opened and they said, what? Well, well, why not? And who did she leave it to? And so I thought, ah, well, maybe this is a good subject for a book. Uh, and probably I wanted to write about it too at some deeper level. Obviously, it must have been very hurtful in some way. So that's what sort of launched me onto the, the, the reality of that situation. And I had to find a structure. Uh, and I think actually it was maybe Bill uh, who had read the Chekhov story, who said to me, well, what about the Chekhov story? Uh, and, um, and so I went back and looked at that. Uh, but of course the Chekhov story got lost to some extent, although you're absolutely right, that scene with the actor uh, is absolutely the lawyer from from the Chekhov story. Except in your book, the it's interesting because in your book the the young actor says, "Oh, you should have many lovers." I mean, he's he's a pretty sympathetic character, and his interaction with her is quite uh, affectionate and nice. But but uh, it, but the uh, <laughs> oops, well, now look what I've done. Um, but but in the uh, but in the Chekhov story, the the guy who said, "Oh, you must have many lovers." Have a different one for every day. I mean, I mean he, he's just infuriating, and uh, and she's in a, a a very difficult moment in her life, and that advice just seems ludicrous and hurtful to her. Uh, one thing I was interested in is that Love Child's written in sections that usually alternate between the past, which in the case of this book is the 1920s, and the present, which is the 1950s. Why didn't you tell your story in a straightforward chronological? Ah, uh, yes, uh, and there lies the story behind that, and I hope that uh, my editor, who's not actually here tonight, I have a wonderful editor at Penguin, um, Catherine Court, uh, and she actually read this book uh, with this, uh, you know, forward story and then the back story that sort of you gather from the backstory why the final decision is made about who gets the money, which we're not going to tell you. No, we don't want to be spoiled. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I had done it that way, and Catherine Court read it. Um, it may be interesting for those of you who are going through this process of publishing things. And she came up with exactly that. She said, what if you just wrote it straight, start at the beginning and go all the way through? And so I said, yes, sir. Uh, you know, being like uh, obedient, um, and I did it uh, because I, you know, I valued her opinion. Uh, and um, and then I sent it to her, uh, and then she read it that way, and she wrote, and she called me up, and she said, you know, I've never done this, Sheila, but actually, I have to tell you, it was better the first way. A lot of extra work for you. <laughs> Again, but I think these things are, are, are always a value, and probably we should write and rewrite and rewrite, you know, 101 times, because every time you do this, of course, you discover something new. Uh, she also had another suggestion for me, and that was she felt the book ended too soon, uh, and I hadn't actually got uh, sufficiently into who does get the money at the end. Um, and so I wrote that chapter too, uh, and that was also uh, prompting from her part. Uh, well, that works very yes. well. Yes, and I yes. Uh -huh. I think that works very well. I mean, to me, the the the, the switching from the 1920s to the 1950s, back and forth, added to the suspense. Mm. I thought because I mean we, just as we thought. Uh, oh, I mean, in in the present, we can see what where she's heading and what she's. Uh, what schemes she's concocting of, of what to do with their money. Uh, but then, what we want to know why she would feel that way. And so by going back to these earlier scenes, uh, we, we get filled in on all that. Well, I'm glad you felt that way. Uh, yes. I also felt like what, one thing that was interesting yeah. is, that, is that the poverty of, of the, in Bill's family when she's young, um, especially when she stays with her aunts, is so, um, so miserable. I mean, she, it, it's it's so uh, uh, suffocating that poverty that it kind of is a relief for the reader 
to alternate that with the tremendous luxury of her uh, present life. <laughs> good, good. And I'm glad about that. Uh, and um, that was a story. I did this last night, did a reading, and, and somebody asked me a question at the end, which was, what was true? What was true in the book? You know, and that sort of thing. And that's one of the things that is true, and that's those three maiden aunts really came from, at one point she runs to these three maiden aunts. You rather wonder why she does. But, uh, and the poverty, although they are very restricted in their uh, lives, they actually, uh, I mean, this is the double will story. There are two wills in this story. There's who is she going to leave her money to, but there's also this question of three, who these, the question of why these three maiden uh, sisters are unmarried. And this really is true. Their father had left a will, if you can believe this, uh, in which if one of those girls married, then the other two had to forfeit the money. And it really wasn't very much money. But, uh, you know, in those days, these women really didn't have much opportunity to do, you know, go out and make a living. So the three sisters married basically were not able to marry and had to remain together. Uh, in this rather miserable house, in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you hear about these strange uh, wills like that. Uh, like, uh, did you ever know Camilla McGrath? Uh, no. Well, she, in spite of her name, was actually a petchy blunt, which meant she owned the royal palace in um, uh, Lucca. And anyway, she and her three sisters inherited it. But the father said they had to go there every year for at least three months a year, or they would lose it. Yeah. So that was his will. Yes. And so it placed this kind of strange uh, imposition on the rest of their lives. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world to go to a royal palace for three months. Uh, without being didactic in any way, your novel tells us worlds about the relations between blacks, coloreds, and whites in apartheid South Africa. Do you feel that you've added significant detail uh, to w uh, what most foreigners assume was the political and racial situation? I mean, I found myself slightly off balance in a very good way. I love books that uh, throw me off balance and that are kind of decentering, if that's a word. Uh, and I felt like I was constantly discovering things about the relations between the, uh, the races that I wouldn't have suspected. Yes, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a political writer, uh, and so um, I did just try to recreate a little bit the reality that I knew growing up in, in South Africa, uh, well, more in the 50s, obviously this goes back to earlier, mm -hmm. early, earlier times too. Uh, so I try to just uh, give you what I would imagine would have happened. But, um, you know, it's, it's true that uh, South Africa is such a strange and disconcerting place. Um, one, of course, this kind of uh, surface um, that is so beautiful and so, uh, and this veneer of civilization and everybody's been so apparently polite and you know in the church scenes everyone's singing you know all things bright and beautiful and and all of this going on on, on one level but underneath there that there was a tremendous amount of violence mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe hopefully that comes out in some way even here uh, the violence of you know white people against white people uh, and whites against black, and then the color, you know, all these absolutely amazing distinctions that were made uh, that were just uh, sort of almost unbelievable. Uh, you know, white people, then there were people of mixed blood who were called coloreds, who had a different status, and there were Indians, and there were, and when you went to the beach, you had to kind of, uh, you know, navigate your way to find which beach you belonged on. And sometimes you didn't really know which which one you belonged to, you know. And there was a test uh, for to, to, if you were black or white. So they had to put your comb in your hair, and if the, if the comb fell through your hair, then you were considered white or something like that. Kind of. It was just, you know, a really crazy kind of world that was set up to try and establish 
these uh, artificial categories between people. And this was, you know, as a small child, was extremely disconcerting. And of course, the people that we really loved were the people who took care of us. Um, yes. Those were black people. And, you know, well, it's interesting because the, 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 two, the two sons in the book who don't much like their mother, uh, they love the Zulu cook. Yes. And, and, yes. and, and he's the one who really takes care of them. Yes, yes. The, a man, true. male cook. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> the, the, lo the love triangle in Love Child is between Bill, this woman named Bill, Helen, and Mark. And it seems so odd and, and mercurial. Because uh, when, when Bill arrives in this family, she's been hired to be a kind of companion to the wife who drinks too much and seems sort of unstable mentally. And, um, and, 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 and Bill is given the keys to the liquor cabinet and all the other keys to sort of uh, be a kind of warden to uh, her, her boss's wife. But then uh, Mark, the husband, falls in love with, with Bill, or at least is very attracted to her sexually, and Helen, the wife, urges Bill to sleep with Mark, uh, but becomes inten intensely unhappy when Mark divorces her, Helen, and Mar marries Bill. Both women, though pampered, drink themselves to death, partly, I suppose, because they've been ostracized by society for their so strange uh, marital arrangements, and partly because their husband uses them uh, for sex or companionship but almost as though they were paid companions. Uh, there's an appalling scene that's very sexy and crazy, where Bill is in the taxi with, uh, uh, with, with Mark, her husband, and he just insists on having sex with her right then and there in the taxi, and you have the feeling she has no right to refuse. Right, right. Yes, well, I suppose that was often the uh, position of women in those days, where uh, particularly uh, people who um, you know, had more or less, um, well, in some ways it was uh, like a kind of form of prostitution, if you will, where you had sort of sold your soul in a way. Uh, not that I think there was, that's the only thing that's going on here. Um, and I don't know that we ever know exactly, you know, how much she feels for her husband. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, the whole situation uh, and this again, you know, is based on my own mother's life, uh, though, uh, of course, we don't know how much of this is true and how much is just invented. Uh, and um, obviously, much of this comes from my imagination and, as I said earlier, from literature. Uh, and certainly the Will story uh, is one that uh, uh, is, runs through so many different books, if you think about it. Uh, it's such a it's a wonderful uh, situation to use uh, and can be used and used again. Uh, and you know you'll think of umpteen examples of that. Uh, you know from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, where there's the will, you know, with the entailed estate, and, and you know Henry James and masses of uh, two wills in Middlemarch. So it's it's uh, it's all over the place. Uh, so again, I don't know how much of this came from um, uh, the reality of my mother's life. One doesn't know in the end. When you've written enough, you don't really know what you're inventing and what actually uh, came from reality. I think there's, there's something that happens too. Uh, well, one of the things that struck me as a writer in reading this was how wonderfully materialized the character Bill is. I mean, it's a very hard thing to discuss, and I don't think non-writers even know what you're talking about, really. But it, there's something when you're writing, you want the character to come alive on the page, to breathe, to have a smell, to take up some space, to sit on the couch in a way that seems believable. And, uh, and, and you do that wonderfully with her. She's a very sensual, character, she's completely bedizened by her rich husband, 
with jewels. I mean, she sort of weighted down with them almost like a, an elephant in India. And I mean, she's just covered with jewels all the time. And, and she's very sexy, but you have the feeling she's slightly overweight. And, and she drinks a lot, of course. And so she's always slightly stunned. <laughs> and, but there, there's something very corporeal about her, very real, I think. Well, I suppose we all try to do that, and certainly you do that wonderfully well. I was just looking again at the beginning of the boy's own story, you know, where you uh, start out with the beginning of that novel, and thinking too of what you said about the beginning of the novel. Uh, in, in that article in the New York Times, uh, the New York Review of Books, uh, you said something about the difference between a short story and a novel, and how in a novel you have to start it out by, uh, yes, getting the interest of the uh, reader, but also by uh, just suggesting a little. And looking at the beginning of that boy's own story, just wonderfully you get uh, with the dog, old boy, right? He's yeah. this incredible name, old boy. And you just get an extension of the father and the way the father is just perfectly obnoxious from the beginning. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. <laughs> and um, these other boys who are tussling <laughs> in the background. And so it's all presented to us with, um, uh, in the flesh, yes. But you know what I mean about getting this fleshliness yes, of, of yes, the character? Yes, yes. And some characters never really come to life in that way on the page, and no matter how much you work on it. And others, I think like Bill, really do. She, uh, well, she breathes. She and, does. Yeah. And she does that. But I mean, it was very hard. Again, when you're writing from life and you're uh, also making a character, uh, there's a question of just getting the right distance. You know, you can't get too close no. because, after all, your your own mother. What do you you? In some ways, your mother is the most mysterious person in your life. It's also the person you are the closest to. But you know, uh, people of our generation, uh, uh, that was more true for us than maybe, it would be for young people maybe. today. I mean, like my students at Princeton, when they talk about their the girls, when they talk about their mothers, it's as though they're talking about their sisters. They share everything. Mm. They, 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 yes. You know, and the mothers, there every other weekend ironing their sheets. <laughs> <laughs> it's just unbelievable. The, whereas my family's quite formal, you know, and we, we just saw them at a little bit at dinner time, but not much. Right, I know. <laughs> I had a student, actually, a young girl who brought in a story at Princeton about um, not being asked to the prom, you know, and that was the story. And so I, I said to her, well, well, where did you get the idea to write the story from? And she said, well, I was talking to my mother on the phone and I told her that I couldn't think of what to write my story about. And she said, well, don't you remember you were, you know, and nobody asked you to the prom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's almost unthinkable for our world, you know, well, um, So there's one more valuable uh, source of, of, of stories that's disappearing. The, the mother, the mysterious no, mother. No, that's still there. I have my daughter somewhere in the back there. And I told her, you know, darling, I do understand. I am your material. You must use it. And she did. <laughs> She's a writer. She's a novelist. Yeah, good. The love triangle uh, in this novel parallels the one that's found in Jane Eyre in, uh -huh. in, in some way. I mean, Helen is the mad that's the original wife, is sort of like the mad woman in the attic. And Bill works for the man of the house in the way Jane Eyre does. And he falls for her just as Rochester. Mm -hmm. Falls for Jane Eyre. I mean, there are parallels. Yes, that that is absolutely, yeah, absolutely true, and, and very mysterious, and and maybe in some and you way. you thought of that when you? Well, uh, no, but you know, Jane Eyre uh, was always a book that was so important to me uh, from when I was really a very uh, young girl, uh, and um, of course, I didn't know this whole story about my mother and this triangle or any way the way I have written it. Uh, in fact, uh, originally my mother had told us, had not told us 
uh, that um, my father's first wife had, um, that she, we were told that she had died. That was all, that's all we knew. So we presumed he'd be married to a woman that, who died and then he remarried and this was, and my mother was his second wife. So we didn't realize that this all, all that was going on beforehand, of course. And this was something that I discovered and embroidered on uh, in this book. Um, but, um, I'm sorry, now I've forgotten your question. Uh, oh, the parallel. Oh, the parallel, with, yeah. yes, with Jane. So, but it does parallel the Jane Eyre story. And of course, my mother's family was always, uh, they, they loved that book. And my aunt actually read me the beginning of that book when I was seven. Uh, and that's kind of <laughs> remained in my mind and is what really made me uh, write Becoming Jane Eyre. Uh, so these things are really uh, connected in a, in a strange way. Um, uh, I'm so happy that you noticed that, um, mm. that it, um, because I'm sure that that did, those connections were there uh, to some extent, mm -hmm. probably in my mother's mind, in my mind growing up, and then obviously came out uh, through these two books that I wrote one after the other. You know? Yes. yes.